Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and, and get our speaker up here. There's a biographical sketch of Sam Beard at your table. Uh, I, Sam Beard is a person that I've known of and respected for many years. He, uh, before getting involved in this Economic Security 2000 and Social Security reform, probably the single most important public policy issue facing uh, any state or nation, uh, he was involved in uh, creating jobs, economic development, creating jobs, uh, especially in the inner city. He, is, he and his organization, the National Development Corporation, are probably as responsible as uh, anyone for bringing uh, what economic vitality there is in the inner city to it uh, through his efforts and through the NDC's efforts over the past uh, 20 years. So without further ado, let me introduce to you someone who, uh, and then we'll go into questions and answers immediately uh, after his presentation, but let me introduce to you and welcome uh, Sam Beard. Griff, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I want to tell you how pleased I am to be here this morning. This is a very distinguished organization and very distinguished membership, so you got me on my toes. I've got to be smart. Larry Kopp tells me I'm not going to be smart this morning. Anyway, thank you very much for having me here. On the economic development front, which I've done for 30 years, I had the privilege of working with uh, Senator Robert Kennedy, and then we took our uh, job creation and economic development ideas all around the country, and early on we started working with Sam Nunn in the United States Senate and then came down to Atlanta under Jimmy Carter's presidency. And uh, we've probably been responsible for something like four or five hundred million dollars worth of small business financing in Atlanta, um, as well as twenty-five billion dollars all around the country. So we worked with Atlanta's banks. I forget the name of it. Is there, is there an Atlanta Progress? It's sort of like the Chamber of Commerce. What's the Central Atlanta Progress, and they worked with the banks, and they, the banks committed $100 million for small business financing, and, and that's what we do. So if my background is economic opportunity, you're going to find out that's what gets me into Social Security. We're running a grassroots effort, and uh, Jim King is here. I had a very nice dinner with uh, Jim last night and Earl Smith, and there are state coordinators. Stand on up. We got volunteers, folks. And, uh, is Phil Smith here for the Concord Coalition? Because Phil's been very helpful from the beginning and helped us sort of get going and introduce us all around the state of Atlanta. Now let me, let me get going. I, the topic is Social Security and economic opportunity. And I basically start off with the view that Social Security is one of the very best federal programs ever created. Since 1961, it's helped lift 17 million Americans out of poverty, and it basically, as a compassionate nation, Social Security says there should be some type of a commitment to a decent retirement income for all Americans. And that's true with every modern economy, and I don't think it's something we should break away from. So here is a most successful program. Now, the most successful program is going towards a big time crisis and it's driven by demographics. And we were talking about demographics this morning uh, and uh, Dudley here is Yale Law School graduate and smarter than I'll ever be and she studied many things including demographics. Um, the best way to understand demographics, 1945 there were 20 people working, two tables, three tables, this half of the room, working, supporting one senior citizen and retiree, and life expectancy was 62. There are now three people working, supporting one, and if we reach age 65, we'd expect to live to 83. And the baby boomers haven't retired yet. When the baby boomers retire, there will be less than two workers asked to finance one senior citizen and on our current course, accept a 60 to 70 percent lifetime tax rate. Medicare and Social Security are pay-as-you-go systems. The young people work and they pay the bills for retired seniors. And you talk to uh, Paul Samuelson and he said, look, when we set up Social Security in the middle of the Depression, you had a rapidly expanding workforce, 
low life expectancy and not that many seniors, of course you make it pay as you go. And so that's the way all these systems are set up. So that's obviously a collision course. We're going to go from 40 million seniors to over 90 million. I was just out in Tucson, Arizona, and Dorcas Hardy, a former Social Security Commissioner, threw out the statistic that if I am a female born today, female born today, one third can expect to live over 100 years. Now just think of that. You have young workers asked to finance someone who will retire at 62 and lived over 100. The math doesn't work, so we have a very substantial crisis. The distinguished Senator Bob Carey from Nebraska and Jack Danforth from uh, uh, Missouri chaired the Entitlement Commission. And on a nonpartisan basis, all of your United States Senators and United States Congressmen understood that we're heading towards an entitlement crisis. And here's their chart. Once the baby boomers retire, by the year 2030, on our current course, Medicare and Social Security will consume more, more than all existing federal revenue. And that's 20% of the whole economy. Now you've got interest on the debt, and then in a tiny little top box is discretionary spending. And that's our commitment to education, job training, Head Start, the environment, defense, and all you have to do is double federal taxes. So put federal taxes at 40% of the economy before you add state and local taxes. That is not a formula for economic growth and a bright future. There is a very substantial entitlement crisis. Now when we look at it, we go beyond the entitlement crisis. And we say that there are other crises which transcend the fact that Social Security's numbers don't work. And we start talking about the fact in America there is a savings crisis. And you can look at that many different ways. In the United States, we're saving at a rate of about 4%, Japan 13%, Germany 12%. And savings directly relates to investment, and investment directly relates to economic growth and our economic future. And we are not saving. Now you look at families. 60% of American families have less than $1,000 total savings. There is a savings crisis. Now when we start pursuing the savings crisis, we connect that to retirement security. So now let's relate that to President Roosevelt. When President Roosevelt set up Social Security, he talked about a three-legged stool. Retirement security is a three-legged stool. Leg one, personal savings. Leg two, a pension. As a safety net, leg three, Social Security. Now, when you look today, we're going to live a third of our lives after we retire. Retirement security is essential for any sort of economic well-being for a third of our lives. And now let's review the three legs. 60% of American families have less than $1,000 worth of savings. Go to age 60 and the median family has $18,000 worth of savings. That is not a strong first leg for at least 60% of the country. With pensions, most small businesses have none, and big businesses running away from their pension commitment because of international competition. Pensions never went over 47% of the workforce. And that's numerical, it's not even talks about p pension adequacy. So 60 to 70% have no or limited pensions. And now you're back to Social Security. And on our current course, we either need to cut Social Security 
or raise taxes 50%. So leg three is in serious trouble. There is a serious retirement security crisis, retirement insecurity. Now let me take a poll, and I'm going to go to a central point for Economic Security 2000. It's something that no one else talks about, so let's focus at it. I'm going to get you to be like laser beams. How many of this room, how many of you in this room feel that your economic opportunity and standard of living is better than your parents? Raise your hand. Your economic opportunity and standard of living better than your parents. All right, now, how many of you feel that the economic opportunity and standard of living of your children and grandchildren will be better than yours? Raise your hand. All right, now, let's look at those hands. 95% your economic opportunity better, and five hands went up, we're going to pass a better economic opportunity onto our kids. And interestingly, that's a high percentage. As I go around the country, 85 to 90 percent, my economic opportunity is better than my parents, and it's somewhere about 10 percent feel that we're going to pass a better opportunity onto our kids. Now, if that's not shocking in America, almost nothing is. This is the land of optimism. This is the land of we're going to do something smart, and we're going to work hard, and we're going to pass a better opportunity on to our kids. Now, let's collect, connect that to Social Security. Part of a better economic opportunity is certainly not to accumulate $30 trillion worth of debt. But also, it is to open the door for economic opportunity for everybody. And a big part of economic opportunity is wealth accumulation. And wealth accumulation is savings. So now, where we're going to go with this is we're going to recommend a funded Social Security system. And we're going to say, if I'm a high school dropout in Atlanta and I have a service job paying $8,000 a year, Payroll taxes are very regressive. 12.4% times 8,000, I am already paying $1,000 a year to Social Security. I, at $8,000, I am a $1,000 a year saver. And what we're saying is why not allow all working Americans to set aside at least $1,000 a year into a 401k kind of account at Social Security. And let's put wealth accumulation back on the table for all of us. And we can pass that on to our kids. Build this up in our working lifetime, live off the income in retirement, and now pass substantial capital ownership onto our kids. And there's a very simple building block. This is the major point that nobody talks about and this is the major point of this speech today. This is what's a little different. Let's just look at this fact. I go get a job and I get paid. And that's wages. Two-thirds of all income comes from I go get a job and I get paid. One-third of all income comes from wealth. I own financial instruments. Why can't we be smart enough in this country to design our systems at a time when we all agree we're passing less opportunity on to our kids to open up the second source of income to all Americans and save the standard of living of our kids. Now, as part of that, I was talking to one gentleman earlier who, who is a consultant working with companies in trouble. And he's talking about the fact we're exporting our jobs overseas. Part of what's happening, which relates to wealth accumulation, is I'm worried that we're losing our middle class. And the top 25% of our society is getting all the rewards of our society, and that's not America. If everything flows to the top 20% and we lose the middle and stockpile the bottom, and this is no longer a country of dreams for everybody, something is wrong in America. And what's happening with our middle class, if I'm a high school graduate, and I'm, I don't have a lot of skills as a high school graduate. And I'm now competing in the new global economy with four billion, 
people willing to work for two dollars a day. And what is going to happen to my standard of living? We need to address these issues. We cannot become a society where the rewards flow to the top. And that relates back to Social Security, because if you think of the $8,000 worker is already setting aside $1,000 a year, the $8,000 worker could substantiate, could accumulate $150,000 in today's money in one working lifetime. And we could open up the second source of income to all Americans, and as we go up the economic scale, we could do better. We can be smart enough to do that. So I start by defining crises. There is an entitlement crisis. There is a savings crisis. There is retirement insecurity. And then there is the crisis or concern that too much of the rewards of our society are flowing to the top, we're losing the middle and stockpiling the bottom. Now, I'm a positive person. Doesn't seem like it yet. <laughs> so now let's go to solutions. No single thing is a single answer to anything. But if you take those crises and then start talking about remodeling Social Security in the 21st century, and you start talking about absolutely save President Roosevelt's commitment of a decent retirement income, but let's add a savings component. Let's create a two-tiered Social Security system. Under Tier 1, we'll keep the safety net, but add Tier 2. Under Tier 2, allow every working American to set aside at least $1,000 a year into a funded savings account, which they own, invested in the private sector. Now, what happens is, currently, let's go back to Social Security, it's pay as you go. The young workers pay, and it's a huge tax transfer to the seniors. There is not a day, there is not a minute of return for investment. It's just a tax transfer. Under the new system, what we're talking about is, and when you talk to Paul Samuelson up at MIT, he says, we've got to change this way. We have to do it so that when you're young and you start working, you set aside a small amount of money and you put the power of compound interest to work and you let it grow for 45 years. At the end of a 45-year period of investment and growth in the private sector, you're going to have a lot of money. And that's where we need to go. So now, what am I saying? Social Security, a two-tiered system, save Social Security. We keep paying our 12.4% to Social Security, and now it gets split. A big chunk of our money goes to pay the existing obligations to existing seniors. We can't change the rules in the middle of the game. We need to meet our obligations to existing seniors, and now a big chunk starts going into our individual funded accounts. Now when I receive Social Security, it comes down two tiers. I'm 57 years old, so I won't have enough time in my funded account to build up enough of a capital nest egg to pay my expected Social Security. But let's say I have $50,000 in that account. So $50,000 in that account, take 5% income, $2,500 gets paid out of this investment account, and Social Security promises me $15,000, so the young taxpayer is in for $12,500. If I'm 30 years old and start setting aside this money, I'll have, let's say, $300,000, $400,000 in that account. So my Social Security benefit might increase 25, 50, or 100 percent, and I'm into the young taxpayer for nothing. If the stock market goes down, people ask me all the time about risk, what happens? If the, if the stock market goes down, the value of my account goes down, what the young taxpayer can afford is to make up the difference between our agreed to commitment of a decent retirement income and wherever the income from this retirement account is. That the young taxpayer can afford. Now, where are we going? I want to make a point about urgency. Urgency. This has to happen in uh, no more than four to six years. If you wait till 2012, which is the first year Social Security has more money going out than coming in, 2012, and it's probably going to be 2006, 
As we're going this way, the first year that Social Security goes broke is coming this way. So now they say it was 2012, but it's down from 2029. So let's say it'll really happen in 2006. That's only 10 years from now. I got a six-year-old daughter. Morgan's going to be 16. That's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. And then what happens is when the baby boomers start retiring 2008, you fall off the table fast and you don't recover. All the politicians are talking about balance the budget, watch the year by 2002. The crisis doesn't hit till 2008. There's not one politician talking about balance the budget 2020. 2020 Medicare and Social Security, $500 billion a year in arrears. No one's even talking about it, they don't want to. Next time you see your state senator or your United States senator or your United States congressman, ask him, what's his plan to balance the budget 2020? And watch the feet. You're going to get the shuffle. Now, urgency. We have to do it now when we can still afford it. Let these accounts build up so when the crisis hits, we've got a cushion. If you wait till 2020, if you wait till Pearl Harbor, until there's a crisis, then, oh my gosh, probably too late then to switch over to a funded system. Grassroots, that's what we're doing. Why are we going grassroots? Alan Simpson spells it out clearer than a bell. He said, as a United States Senator, the Senate is not a leadership vehicle. It's a followership vehicle. Until in his words, 15 to 25 million Americans say, I don't want my federal taxes to double. I don't trust the government. I don't trust that Social Security will be there for me when I retire. I don't trust the trust fund because not only is there no trust in it, there's no money in it because you've spent every penny of it. And what I would trust is at least $1,000 a year to go into an account with my name on it. I would trust that, so don't double my federal taxes and let me, out of taxes I'm paying, put $1,000 a year into this funded account. Until 15 to 20 million Americans start saying that, nothing will happen with the politician. That's why we're here. And when I get done with the questions and answers, I'm going to go back to these orange cards and I'm going to sign you all up and tell you what we need you to do, so get ready. Our grassroots model, to make it clear, people say, well, I don't think we can do that. I don't think we can change. Our grassroots model is mothers against drunk driving. Candy Leitner's daughter was run over by the drunk. She had no name recognition, no money. She had compulsion. And she started, everybody said, don't, you'll never change these laws. And she started crisscrossing the country. And the bottom line was, it's a wonderful thing about this country. The success is not Candy Leitner. The success is that thousands of people rose up and said, wait a minute, we're on the wrong course. And they changed the law in all 50 states and the national attitudes. And we can do that with our entitlements. When you go back to that show of hands about economic opportunity, everybody in this country knows we're on a course that is not working. Now let's translate this into real lives. I go to Wilmington, Delaware, and there's an individual, uh, 55 years old, three kids, working in a plant. His life income is $30,000. His wife used to work, but she's quit working to take care of the kids. So now he goes and gets a second job, and on weekends and nights he drives a truck. Total income, $30,000. He has less than $500 in a savings account. He feels mad as hell, frankly. He feels on a total treadmill. The harder he works, the less money he takes in, and he's trying to do all this stuff for his kids. And he's volunteering, and he works with uh, baseball leagues and all that stuff. And he doesn't have enough money to put furniture in the den. Now, you're going to talk to him about savings. You know, you've got to find an extra $2,000 a year to put in a 401k, he'll laugh at you. But at $30,000, he is paying $4,000 a year to Social Security. And would he like to have $2,000 of that, half of that, in an account with his name on it, and let it build up? Absolutely. 
Now you go to a single female, 28 years old, with two children in Utah. She feels totally caught. Come Friday, she doesn't know how she's going to pay her bills. And she earns $25,000 a year. And educationally, she's never going to transcend to be a fifty or $75,000 worker. She's caught at that level. And she works for a small business. And she's scared. If she loses that job, her next job is going to pay less. If she can get one. And she doesn't have enough money to tide her family over for three weeks. I mean, this is much more reality. This is like 75% of the country. And that's what we run into. And that $25,000 a year woman is paying $3,000 a year to Social Security. We need to do something. Then I go down to Pickens, South Carolina, and there's a 75-year-old woman called Hattie. And since age 12, she's been in the fields picking beans. She is still in the fields picking beans to try to make ends meet. And she is receiving $288 a month from Social Security. And what she says is the $288 is too much to die on, but not enough to live on. So what we say, ladies and gentlemen, is we need your help and we can do better. Thank you very much. Question. See, on the IRA, I mean, I love the private sector. That's what I've done all my life. Uh, let's address the IRA really only applies to the top 25% of the country. I was asked to write this book about economic opportunity. Nothing to do with Social Security. And here's why I got into Social Security. I started looking at a family earning $50,000 a year. And it's like my plant guy in Delaware, and it's like my single parent in Utah, and it's like everybody around the country. A family earning $50,000 a year pays their taxes, living expenses, one to two car payments. Now, what do they have left for savings? What do they have left to put in the IRA? For the most part, nothing. And that is the 75th percentile of the country. Now, when I talk to... Uh, 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 investment managers, they'll tell you they don't even market a family earning $50,000 or under. Don't even market them. And that's 75% of America. So that's what, why I got into Social Security. Because the, the $50,000 worker is paying um, uh, about $6,200 a year to Social Security. That's a lot. The, the $50,000 earner uh, is a big saver but not putting compound interest to work. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, if, if Social Security is still being used to match the uh, federal debt, when will they stop? <laughs> well, you, you have uh, certain United States senators who stand up and they say the following thing. They say, we're cutting the deficit. They're very, they're very dramatic about it. We're cutting the deficit. We're doing everything we can. We understand the problem, but we need a little time. And we're going to adjust. And by 2012, we're no longer going to take any money out of Social Security. Now, the answer is they're going to steal every penny until there's nothing left. By 2012, there's more expense than income. So that's when they're going to stop. Now, and in this whole balance of the budget debate, all this pontificating about they don't want to do it because of Social Security is, is poppycock. In the interest of balancing the budget, the actual cash surplus in Social Security is $30 billion a year. And you're going to hear a number of $70 billion. But with that is $40 billion of that is paper interest on money they've already stolen. So the actual cash surplus in 1997 is $30 billion. And now the politicians are pumping it all up, telling you how you're going to balance the budget. And, and they want to make as few cuts as possible. They're addressing it partially seriously, but they need the $30 billion from Social Security because they're not going to get real. 
Now, the, the, the sad part is we need about 100 to $120 billion a year to put into these funded accounts, and we need to meet our obligations to seniors. And that $30 billion surplus, for as long as it lasts, should start to, to fund these accounts. And so you got those problems. Yes, sir. The first, I appreciate this, this whole group because I figure I'm going to get all sorts of wonderful and very detailed questions that I have. And when I tell groups when I speak, I say, I've got a cheater list up here. I've got seven questions. And if you don't ask them, then I'll tell you what they were. <laughs> <laughs> and so far, so far, you're doing absolutely great. Now, the, let's assume that's a multifaceted question and the answer goes something like this. Let's start with a basic. Every economist agrees we have a savings crisis. And then the question is, what percent of uh, GDP is that savings crisis? And they put it somewhere between 4 to 6 percent. Now, 4 to 6 percent is about a $400 billion a year, 4 or $500 billion a year savings crisis. Now, if we start to do this, you're talking about adding 100 to 120 billion dollars to savings. So start off in a seven and a half, eight on its way to 10 trillion dollar economy where everybody admits we have a savings crisis. There are many opportunities to put that money and it's not all in the Fortune 500. You've got bond markets, you've got stock markets, you can go all the way around the world. In fact, it, depending on how you're looking at it, if I'm the trustee, of the money for retirees, I want to get the best rate of return, and I'll go anywhere that I can get the best rate of return. Yes, in America, yes, in the bond market, yes, anywhere around the world. Now, my whole specialty is small business. I will tell you there's a hundred to two hundred billion dollar a year small business capital shortage in America as we sit here. And you'd have to do some different adjustments because it wouldn't pass the prudent man rule. You'd have to set up sort of a Fannie Mae operation for small business financing, but that would be a major economic growth policy for the country to get to that and start to flow these monies into uh, uh, small business. So in effect, what I'm saying to you is everybody agrees on the one hand we have a four to six hundred billion dollar a year savings crisis, and then it's non sequitur to say if you had an extra hundred billion dollars to invest, there's no place to put it. Now, let's, but let's, let, me ask, let me go on to the next part of it. The question I get asked all the time is risk. And what do you do with people who know nothing about investing money, and you're going to give them the $1,000 a year, and they're going to own it and invest it, and they won't know anything to do about it? Now, my answer to that is it depends how you design it. I would design it so that people have no choice whatsoever. I, I would do it very conservatively. And I look at the existing American pension system. It now has 40 to 50 million people in it, and it has about $5 trillion. And about two-thirds of that is defined benefit. So by definition, defined benefit, the state of Georgia, the DuPont Company, uh, General Motors, has hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, professionally managed. So in effect, I visualize large, like mutual funds, large pools of retirement money. Each of us is in this room would have an account. We would absolutely own the money. And from there on, I'd give you no choice. Because most people don't. Now, someone like Ned Gramlich, who's the chairman of President Clinton's Advisory Council on Social Security, which just came out with their panel. I'm going to ramble a little bit here, but it was a wonderful report. All members of President Clinton's panel said we have to use the extra rate of turn of the private sector to save Social Security. Two-thirds said let's go to individual funded accounts and add a savings component. Now Ned Gramlich would give people the following choice. The government would approve a small number of private sector money managers 
and then he would allow people to choose uh, from, let's say, a list of five different investment portfolios. Now, I ended up being against that because if one of the choices is all government bonds with the 401ks, too many people low income put all the money in government bonds because it's safe. And when you take a 45-year period, you want to have a diversified portfolio. So I would give them no choice. I would give them the choice of here's a, a, a list of government approved private sector money managers and you can pick whoever you want to run your money. Your money goes in there at no cost and it comes out at no cost at any time you want. Let's say with a month notice, something of that nature. Uh, but from then on, no choice. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Don't think so. The, right now, the, the Social Security part of the federal debt, in terms of what they're taking to balance the budget, is really insignificant. It's the $30 billion a year. And it just, it just would have almost no impact. Now, I'll tell you what does have an impact, and you'll read this in the newspapers. Uh, and we debate this all around the country. The people who want to keep the system just the way it is, I mean, there's a, a fellow called Henry Aaron who's not the ball player. He's a top economist at Brookings. And he writes a front page story in the uh, Washington Post saying, what's all this stuff? There is no Social Security crisis. No crisis. And uh, we don't even have to worry about it until 2030. Now, I just told you 2012 and shrinking. Now, he says 2030. Now, he gets to 2030 by saying, when you get to 2012, the trust fund has an IOU of $3 trillion. And he says, well, the government isn't going to default on its bonds. $3 trillion, it's safe. And he then says, anybody who's in the financial business, if you were the uh, chief financial officer for Aetna, and you were investing however many billions of dollars Aetna invests, and you had 20% of your portfolio in government bonds, you would be considered prudent. That's a safe investment. It's maybe the most solid part of your investment portfolio. So Henry Irons says, given that, this $3 trillion is uh, solid as a rock. Now there's a difference. Right now, that $3 trillion is a paper IOU. It's not public debt. The government has not issued it. It's just sitting there, and we could double it in this room today. We could say, okay, it's uh, right now 1.3 trillion, and let's double it, 2.6 trillion. It's just a paper thing, and it doesn't involve the taxpayers, and it doesn't involve the private markets. We haven't done anything, we just took a piece of paper, we said 1.3 times 2, 2.6, and then you get to the end of the year, and now interest, we'll just add it. You know, instead of 40 billion, it's now 80 billion, so you add interest to 80. You need to go along like that. Now, Henry Aaron says that's just great. Now, the government reports are actually very honest. And they tell you that it is a debt. And that come to 2012, when we owe the three trillion dollars, it then says here's the choice as to how to get that three trillion dollars back. Choice one, cut government spending three trillion. Now you say that, everybody laughs. This lady's in hysterics. She's been taking notes, her head's going up and down, now she's laughing. But everybody laughs. That's not a serious thing. Cut government spending three trillion. Raise taxes. Now that's real. Now the math is you got 71 million families in America, three trillion dollars. That's $42,000 a family. Now, I would love it if Henry Aaron would say to the country, no problem with Social Security, because come 2012, we got this great plan. We're going to tax every family in America $42,000, and with that, there's no crisis. I think most families in America would think that is a crisis. And then it's worse, because the $3 trillion is just like buying out a sinking ship. That $3 trillion buys you 17 years. 
And the first day of the 18th year, Social Security is now running annual deficits of $250 billion. And the last choice is increase the national debt 36%. That's what the government reports tell you. And that would add an interest rate in today's money of more than $100 billion, which at a time of trying to balance the budget is more money than we're paying federal government for education, Head Start, job training, environmental protection, and all inner city programs. I think that's a crisis. I look at it as a crisis. Uh, next question. Let's go to the back and then we'll come here. Yes, sir. Less and less what? That's interesting. That's the first I've ever heard of that. It's very interesting. It's the first I've ever heard of that. Uh, it's fascinating. See, I always hear it in terms of, at some point, the kids are going to rebel. This assumption that this contract that just continues and young pay and the old receive and like that, and no one's ever going to break it. Uh, I've always heard it in terms, and I think it's right, that at some point the kids are going to say, no, thank you. When you throw Medicare in, payroll taxes will go to 30% of wage before income taxes, and at some point the kids just say, no, thank you, there'll be a tax revolt. I've never heard of it in, in a racial context. That's very interesting. Uh, let's go to, to, to this question here. And then I'm going to answer two, and then, because I was supposed to get out of here, I think, at quarter of, and I answer one question that hasn't, and I'm happy to stay and answer questions as long as you want. I have no time problem. I'm just worried about you all having to go off to work. Yes, sir. Grassroots, the only thing I'm telling you. There's nothing other than grassroots. And here's an interesting part. I mean, I, uh, let me mumble a little bit, and then I'll come to you next. The, um, so let's talk about grassroots. Let's go to these orange cards. Everybody who works in this field, which I do, just says flat out that this will not change until we go grassroots will not change until we go grassroots. Now, let's start with the numbers game. Anybody who thinks you sort of like what you're hearing, we'd like you to sign your name and put your address on this. It doesn't cost you any money. It's just a numbers game. At year end, we say we have so many members. And Congress makes, that makes sense to Congress. And then you say, in Georgia, we have so many thousands of people who agree with this message. So the first thing is, we'd just like to collect your name if you're so inclined. There's obviously no pressure to do anything. Next, we go beyond that. How many of you here are members of another neighborhood, civic, nonprofit, or community organization or church group? Raise your hands. Everybody, that's the way America is. Now, this speech that I gave is not very complicated. The bottom line is, do you want your federal taxes to double or would you like to have $1,000 of taxes you're already paying to go into your account with your name on it? Not too hard a speech. Do you want to pass $30 trillion debt onto your kids, or should we wake up and do something about it? We can get you our materials. You don't have to be a big speech mayor. I'm getting better. <laughs> but we'll give you the materials. We'd like for you to take it, these materials, to the organizations you're a member of and have them pass a resolution because that's also a numbers game. All these different organizations brought this resolution to their board. These organizations have 1,000 members, so there are 
10,000 organizations with 100 members, and whatever that math is, a million people want to change this. That also adds to the numbers game. Now I'm going, I'm going to have a press conference this morning, and then uh, I'm going to have the privilege of going over to the uh, uh, House of Representatives of the State Senate, where they're going to uh, submit the first in the country a non-binding resolution in your House of Representatives saying, let's do this thing. And so that's what we'd like you to do with all of your neighborhood organizations. Now the next thing we want to ask you to do is be a speaker. And don't worry about it, say, oh, I'm not a good speaker. We'll get you all the stuff, we'll train you, we'll give you slides, we'll give you anything you want, and, and it's a question of going around to Kiwanis groups and Lions clubs and, and minority groups and women's groups. Most important, interestingly, it's easier sell. You can go to Rotary and they all agree with you. But it's much more important to go to women's groups. This opens up equity for women, economic rights for women, equity and economic rights for minorities. Start lining up these groups. We, we need speakers. So the bottom line is we need help. And then it's like, when I worked with Bobby Kennedy, he always talked about you throw a little pebble in the ocean and you get these circles. And if someone else throws a pebble in the, in the ocean, you get little circles. And if enough people of goodwill start to throw pebbles in the ocean, you get circles, and then the circles start uh, coinciding, you, you have a movement. And that's what we're talking about here. So don't think that, gee, this is just an intellectual exercise, and wasn't it nice, and what Sam was talking about was also important, but we can't make a difference. The answer is you are very important opinion makers. In this community, you can make a difference. So please sign up and on there say you want to bring your stuff to an organization, you get a pledge signed, you'll be a speaker, whatever you want. We need your help. Bottom line. Yes, sir, in the back. All right, let me, let me raise one point here. The, there are a couple of models for what we're talking about around the world. There's Chile, and then there's Singapore. And in Latin America, there are about seven countries now following the Chile model, and over in Asia, there are about 10 or 15 countries following the Singapore model. Now, when I make a speech like this, some people come up to me and they say, you should really talk about the fact that what you're talking about exists in Chile because it gives everybody the confidence that this is not just pie in the sky, that it exists somewhere. Then I talked to Jim Tobin, the Nobel economist at Yale, and he said, when you make this speech, never mention Chile. <laughs> because in the United States, we want to think we're going to invent it here. And the United States isn't going to say, well, we got ourselves into financial difficulty, and we're going to look to Chile. <laughs> so, so at any rate, it, it works in Chile. Now, the, all of life sort of ends up in the middle. I love the private sector, and I can assure you, I can assure you, if there is not government regulation of some sort, the private sector will go off and do the craziest darn things, and in fact, they will rip off unsuspecting grandmothers, and it would be a disgrace. And they would put these monies in uh, uh, derivative bonds and wacko stuff. Uh, and it would really be appalling what the private sector would do at a time we desperately need the very best of the private sector. So the concept of some sort of government regulation is something such as create criteria. This should not just be a shooting license for anybody to say, I'm going to go in the investment management business. You should have been, to be approved, you should have been in the investment management business so many years you should be managing so many millions of dollars. You should have some sort of uh, character test, some sort of performance records, something of that nature. Then out of that, we can then pick from that approved list. And then again, the pension model is very important because it, it regulates through ERISA, 
the kinds of acceptable investment. This is not all your wacko stuff. I'm going to get the hook, Riff. Is that the idea? All right. Now, let me just go to one last question, which was not asked, and I'll give you a sh sh quick answer. It's a very important question. And anybody who, who wants to ask other questions, come up. I'll be here. It's the transition. I have said, simply, we have to meet our obligations to existing seniors and at the same time start funding these accounts. To do that, we're missing something like $100 billion. Excuse me, Sam, but where does the $100 billion come from? Now, the transition answer is, if we don't find the $100 billion, come to 2012, trying to keep the current system is five to six times more expensive and you can't afford it. At this point, there are now like 12 transition systems with all the numbers worked out. And 12 months from now, there'll be 25. And there is no simple answer. There is no simple answer. We are in a difficult spot. But that should challenge our ingenuity. Fundamentally, the transition system works something like the following. You take Social Security and you get the actuaries, of which I met one this morning. Where's, where's my friendly actuary? There we go. And you shrink the existing system by raising normal retirement age, adjust CPI. There are 25 things an actuary can do. And you shrink that, and then you take the surpluses, and now the extra surpluses that you've created, and you, can, and you put the power of compound interest to work. And as compound interest is building these investments in the private sector, you're buying out the $7.5 trillion of unfunded liability. So that's the, some sense of that is where the transition will go. Uh, anybody that wants to ask me questions, please see me afterwards. Griff and everybody, thank you very, very much.